thank you very much. Um, I will show you today two examples of how blue sky research has possibly impacted um, the way we can prevent and we can treat infectious disease. Infectious disease is a really a major problem, not just in developing countries where it stunts growth, but it's also a major problem in developed economies with diseases such as hospital-acquired infections. Now, we can prevent infectious disease with sugar. Now, you're going to say, maybe this guy has completely, gone completely crazy because we know that carbohydrates are used to, for nutrition. They may be used as materials the green things outside called trees and the shells around seafood, those are complex carbohydrates. But carbohydrates are also very important in life at a point where you most likely don't remember it, when a sperm cell and an egg cell get together. The reason we are interested in carbohydrates is for the fact that all of us are surrounded by carbohydrates that surround us in form of a glycocalyx on mammalian, but also on bacterial cells. If you look at history of vaccination, it was pointed out in the introduction, we started with Jenner some 200 years ago, deriving vaccines from cows. And then we move forward to cellular and recombinant vaccines. And now the trend of the future is going to go to synthetic vaccines made from first principles. Today, in Chile, Hopefully your children are vaccinated with at least one or likely three carbohydrate-based vaccines that work against pneumonia and meningitis, amongst other diseases. They have saved millions of lives worldwide, and Prevnar, a Pfizer vaccine, makes more than five billion US dollars in revenue per year. So it's very efficacious, and it makes people a lot of money. So how do these vaccines work? The idea is you have to teach the human immune system to recognize the pathogen as foreign. So you need a cell surface molecule, and in this case, we use a carbohydrate. The problem is that a human immune system cannot recognize carbohydrates as foreign. So you have to hook the carbohydrate together for protein that is being recognized, and that so-called conjugate vaccine is what's given to children. So it's working great. So the question is, why can't we make more vaccines? The problem is that all vaccines are made today in the area of carbohydrates. You have to culture the pathogen. And in many cases, that's not possible. And then you might ask yourself, so maybe one can just use chemical synthesis to make these molecules. And that's been tried for over two decades. The problem has been that even a team of five or 10 chemists had to work months and oftentimes years to make one single molecule. If you didn't make the right molecule the first time around, you went back, and again, you spend a year or a year and a half making that molecule. When I started my academic career at MIT, we developed a much faster synthesis. And today, you can use automated instruments to make the same molecule, not in years or months, we can do it in a few hours. And that means that the acceleration of the synthetic process gives us multiple shots on goal in trying to make new vaccines. So at Max Planck Institute I'm directing, we are right now exploring vaccines against more than 10 different diseases. Malaria was mentioned, but also we mainly work on bacterial vaccines. I will not go into any detail. I will just say that one of the vaccines we are trying to work on right now is against streptococcus pneumonia. All of you, in this room, carry streptococci in your nasopharynx. Don't worry, it's not going to kill you yet. But if your immune system may be suppressed, or if you, for example, have to, undergo, have to go to hospital, this could become a problem. So Pfizer has developed Prevnar, which is now, as I said, saving millions of lives. But it only covers 13 out of 96 known serotypes. And so we need, we need to expand the number of streptococcal serotypes to go into this vaccine. And in our institutes, we have now greatly increased that number. But now, as basic researchers, we are facing a problem. We can technologically do this, 
but we have to convince the companies to actually move this forward. So we thought maybe we shouldn't rely on the existing companies, maybe we should just start a new company, and so we just um, launched together with a very large Swiss company that funded all this in the first 30 million euros to start with, and then more to come, a company that actually brings carbohydrate-based vaccines based on synthetic chemistry into a marketplace. This would be too expensive to carry out at a government research organization that's even as well funded as Max Planck. Yes. So until the day where we have vaccines against all these different infectious diseases, we have to treat people. And one of the goals might be to make drugs that can actually be afforded by everybody. And I'm not talking about Chile, I'm not talking about Germany, United States. I'm talking about people in Southeast Asia and people in Africa with very little means. But when I talk to you about this, I should also admit that the way we make drugs today is very, very ineffective. For us as chemists, we are similar to cooks. So you think about, you make a batch of, of potato chips, it's a batch system, okay? You can vary it greatly, but it's only used to make high-value items. If you make potato chips in really large quantities, you do it in a continuous process. We also make cars in continuous processes. Oil refineries work in continuous processes. Pharmaceuticals, to this day, are not made by continuous processes. And the reason is shown here. On the left side of the panel, you see the cost aspects of patented drugs. And manufacturing, shown in yellow, is a very small piece, 4 to 8%. So if I save money, it has very little impact on the bottom line of the drug cost. If I go to generic drugs, all of a sudden, the cost of manufacturing is somewhere between 40 and 80% of the cost of a drug. So if I can save half that money, then I have a real impact on bottom line. When we started this research about 10, 15 years ago, I didn't think about any of these aspects I'm telling you about now. As I said, I'm a very simple person, and all we try to do, we try to turn around one electron. Why? Because we wanted to take what's called triplet oxygen and what we're all breathing, and we wanted to turn on this electron and make singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is a wonderful oxidizing agent that can be used in the chemical industry. The way it's made is by taking oxygen, taking a dye, and then shining a light on this dye and exciting the electron. The way this is typically done is in a big bucket. The problem is when you shine a light on a big bucket, the first few millimeters will get the light, and the inside will get nothing. So in pharmaceutical industry, it's typically done in a 3,500 liter tank. So you have to stir for a long, long time. So the simple idea we had is, why don't we just take, instead of a bucket, we take a piece of tubing. And we wrap that tubing around the lamp. So the path for the light is always short, it's always easy. And this is what we did. I will now make a case for you of how from complete blue sky research, turning around electrons, we can reduce the price for making the most important malaria drug drastically. So let's say you wouldn't sit in this nice room here. You would now be in Africa, and you have even a bed net to protect your children. But maybe your child is going to get stung by mosquito anyway, it's going to have a fever. So you're going to go to a pharmacy. This is a typical pharmacy in West Africa, and you're going to buy yourself a malaria drug. The bad news is that 43% of malaria drugs sold in Africa or Southeast Asia are fake. They are fake because the prices are too high for these people. The expenditure per person per year in Sub-Saharan Africa is 50 cents per person. 50 cents per person. So this has to be very, very cheap. Now, as a very powerful drug, which is maybe the only good outcome of the Vietnam War, it's called artemisinin. It was extracted out of these Artemisia annua bushes that grow on the border between China and Vietnam. And out of these, in the early 70s, two UU Chinese scientists isolated this very interesting molecule from a chemical perspective, which he named artemisinin. Since 2001, this is the 
way of how we should treat, according to the World Health Organization, malaria. And for her efforts and the saving of literally millions and millions of lives, Tu Yuyu received a Nobel Prize last year. So that was great. The problem is that the price for artemisinin fluctuates drastically. And the people who make the money are not the people shown in this picture. The farmers can barely make a living off this. It's a very, very difficult business model. But the prices change drastically. So the world community started to think about how can we make this in a better way. A colleague, Jay Kiesling, in the United States, used synthetic biology by modifying yeast in order and an effort to take this biosynthetic pathway and make the drug. But they could not completely make it because it's not only made by enzymes, it requires a photochemical step in the end. And so we thought maybe what we had invented to make singlet oxygen would be applicable here because this last chemical step involves singlet oxygen. So this blue sky research and this problem apparently fit together. So this is one person who did all this work. The total cost of this project was about $100,000. And Francois Levesque, who now works for Merck, um, he now shows you the early stages. This is the instrument. This, can, this is basically two pumps. The big box on the right-hand side is a photoreactor, which is a lamp which is contained and that is wrapped around with tubing. We have two liquids. The dark one is the starting material. And this is plant waste. We use plant waste. We use an acid. Those two get pumped into this uh, tubing. And on the other side, there is a tank of oxygen. So what we are using for this experiment is waste of Artemisia plants. We are using oxygen and we are using light. Sounds entirely crazy, but actually it works. So he connects the pieces, he turns on the machine, and the pumps deliver at an apparently slow speed the two solutions together. And this looks very primitive, but in this system, you could make about 200 grams of drug per day. We now build a prototype for a factory that makes 10 tons per year, and the size of a reactor is less than the size of a piece of paper. And the cost is less than $2 million for this kind of factory. So what you can see now is that the solution in sort of purple, that is the starting material plus the dye, so plant waste plus the dye. From the other side, you get the oxygen coming in, this is now going around the photoreactor, this is now a camera image inside a photoreactor, a very strong lamp. The stuff gets passed around the lamp, and then what you see is um, the red color comes out and a green color passes because the red color gets mixed with an acid, and the acid plus the intermediate give you the final material. Out of this green color, we then, in the end, continuously purify the um, malaria drug. So the situation that presents itself today is that about 200 tons of artemisinin are made every year by extraction. And the extraction process is very inefficient. The plant has about 1% of material, but the extractors can only get 0.4% typically. The price of drug today is $230 per kilo. It was an initiative by Amuris and by Sanofi to do synthetic biology. Unfortunately, this was not competitive, and so this program was stopped. Sanofi sold the plant, and this entire thing has been decommissioned. After we filed the patents, we offered the patents to companies for free to do this. They didn't want to do it, so we started a company to push this forward, but not to make money. The goal of our Temiflow is to make as much malaria drug at the lowest possible price for as many people as possible. So you might ask yourself, so why does it affect me in Chile? We have no malaria problem. We also have no HIV problem. But we published a paper last year showing that the same approach can be used to make efavirenz, one of the most important HIV drugs. And we published a paper not thinking that anybody would be interested. And so I get a phone call from South Africa. And long story uh, short, we have now an agreement with the president of South Africa and health minister to help them build a factory in South Africa because they're spending 70% of their healthcare budget on HIV drugs because 30% of the population is infected. Chile's HIV problem is also not very big, but 
this, this principle has now been applied to many, many other drugs, and we think that it will be possible in the near future for many countries, including yours, to have your own factories to make many drugs that are important for you at very low cost, and therefore become more independent and make the drugs you need at lower prices. So we clearly have a technology. This is not a problem. The question is, are we going to be able to change the system? And I'm not at all speaking against the pharmaceutical companies. We need new patented drugs, and we need these big pharmaceutical companies. At the same time, we need affordable vaccines, we need affordable drugs to help those people that are poor and are in the biggest need. Thank you very much.